Well, hello and welcome to another session of Faith Foundations. Today, we're looking at how do I read the Bible? What does it look like to read the Bible and to get to grips with it? The Bible has been the source and authority on who God is, what he's like, and how he acts for followers of God for thousands of years. God inspired people to write the Bible through his Holy Spirit, and the result is nothing short of miraculous. I've embarrassed myself many times over the years, but one of the moments I embarrassed myself is when I argued with a few of Hannah's cousins that the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings were two completely different stories. I later then went on to read The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings and realised I was completely wrong. And I've since fallen in love with the incredible story across The Lord of the Rings saga. I'm a bit of a nerd in case you didn't know. In the Bible, we have a library. Bible means library, there's the Greek word biblios, of 66 books that tell one overarching story, God's big story. And that is the miracle, that a library of 66 books written over hundreds of years by multiple authors and editors comes together to tell one cohesive and incredible story about the God who makes a way for his people to be with him. If we look at the Bible as a disjointed collection of stories and themes, we will miss out on what God has been saying from creation until today. Because although the Bible is full of people, it is about God. God wrote a book so we can know him and make him known. So in this one big story, there's four movements. Instead of seeing the Bible as a book with chapters that follow kind of a, a straight linear line, it can be helpful instead to see it as a piece of music with four movements or a play with four acts. Each movement or act builds upon the other while continuing to resonate with what has come before it. Wherever you are in the Bible, you will be reading and resonating with these four movements. So what are these four movements? Number one, creation. In Genesis 1 and 2, but echoed across the whole of scripture, is the account of God making the world. That he alone is the author of life and all natural things. God is not only the cause of all things, but he is the point of all things. All things were made in him and for him. Every created thing finds its ultimate fulfillment and purpose in God. Colossians chapter 1 verses 16 to 17 says it like this, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. The creation that he made is good. With each stage of creation, God said over it, it is good. And the pinnacle of creation is human beings. God said, let us make mankind in our image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. We are mini idols designed to image and reveal God to the created order, working together as male and female to steward and expand God's good and perfect creation across the world. If that's the first movement then, the second movement is the fall. Only the world had stayed the way that it was. However, as we know, that's not the case. In Genesis 3, God's first humans, our representatives, Adam and Eve, rebelled against God. And instead of ruling over created things, they were ruled by them. They rejected the God who made them and knew them. And what he had said was good and right. The results of the fall were twofold. Number one. Our relationship with God was fractured and broken. We were no longer friends of God, able to walk in his presence, but instead we set ourselves up as enemies of him, rebelling against him and able to be with God in whom we find our meaning. This has led us to losing sight of who God is. We blame him for the things that are wrong in the world. We set up cheap imitations of God, worshipping the created things rather than the creator God, as we read in Romans 1. Not only that, but as a result of our, our sin, our relationships with each other become fractured and broken. 
Instead of acting as God's image bearers, we act as the opposite. We trade grace, kindness, love and selflessness for selfish ambition, hatred, judgment and unforgiveness. The way you might, the way you might want to look at this is that the sin has led to an issue with our vertical relationship with God and our horizontal relationship with one another. The third movement then is redemption and reconciliation. This third movement is the longest in the Bible as we see God make a way, redeeming and reconciling his people despite their constant and appalling rebellion and rejection of him. God's plan is to make a way for his people, to be able to be in his presence again and to live as they were created to be. God does this in two ways. The first we see unfolding through Genesis and across the whole of the Old Testament. God sets a specific people apart for himself, the people of Israel. He gives them commands and laws to follow, to set themselves apart and to see others drawn to the God who they are reflecting. Tragically, his people continue in a cycle of rebellion, betrayal and sin. Yet despite all of this, God continues to save, listen and direct his people. It is through the later years of the Old Testament we begin to hear the whispers, the promises, the hope of the one who will come and turn people's hearts back to God and end the cycle of rebellion that even God's people are still trapped in. And this is where Jesus enters the story. We read this in the four gospels. Jesus's life, death and resurrection is the door on which the whole of the Bible and the whole of history swings. God sent his one and only son to live a perfect life, which we couldn't live and to die the death that we did deserve so that we could be forgiven. Jesus' resurrection is the sign, the symbol of that cataclysmic event which shows that sin and death and shame have been defeated forever. This is the redemption we needed. Jesus paid the price, he reconciled us to God and is restoring us as his image bearers. He restores us to life and to the meaning for which we were made for. And this is what the rest of the New Testament majors on. God's people working out this incredible salvation and sharing it with the world. If those are the first three movements then, the final one is completion. But the New Testament also says that God is not finished. The fulfillment of all that has been promised from Genesis to Jesus has not yet been realised. We have a future hope. We are waiting longing for Jesus' return. Because when Jesus returns, he will bring heaven to earth, fully restoring God's good creation, and God will dwell with his people again. Those who are continued in sin and rebellion are judged, and the earth once again becomes paradise. The Bible describes this in Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 to 4, where it says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Life will be renewed to all that it was created to be and more. Okay. If those are the four movements, if that is God's big story, what we come next to is the how. If all of that is true, then how do we get to grips with the Bible to see God and ourselves together in that big story? Well, two quick things before we get onto some practical points. Point number one, the Bible is clear. God did not write a book that you need a PhD to understand. The most obvious meaning of what you read is normally the meaning. We should have confidence when we read the Bible. But the second thing is about context. Having said what I've said about the Bible being clear, the Bible was written to a specific people at a specific time in history by a specific person. And as a result, for us to understand, truly understand what God is saying, we need to understand what it meant 
for them so that we can apply what it truly means to us. Most Bibles will have a page at the start of each new book that you read explaining this context. And there's some easy and accessible resources available to us as well that we can use. And I'll explain a bit more about that later. So when I pick up the Bible, what do I do? Well, point number one, pray. We ask the Holy Spirit to help us understand what we're reading. It's one of the roles that the Holy Spirit has to make the text come alive in our hearts. We begin with and come back to the life of Jesus. Jesus is the magnetic point which all the Bible is drawn towards. So if you're starting reading the Bible, start with Mark and John. The third thing, start a regular pattern of reading the Bible. Flicking and pointing is not a good way of understanding God or the Bible and what he is saying. Fourthly, have a rhythm. It's different from a routine. A rhythm is something that if you miss something on that day, you pick it up later. You put into practice what you read. So as we read the Bible, we're not just hearers of the word, we are doers of the word as well. And finally, we read the Bible in community, that actually we should be reading something that was often written to be listened and heard to together, that we read it together and we, we go deep in it together. We do this on Sundays when we listen to God's word preached and we do this in groups when we're, we're reading the word and what it is saying. If you are starting to read the Bible for the first time and, and you're, you're, you're considering some ways of doing it, there are so many good reading plans out there. And there's also things like audio Bibles. One of my favourite audio Bibles is the Streetlights Bible. It's a Bible that is read to a good beat. I find that really helpful when I'm listening to the Bible to help me engage with it. But you can ask the people around you, as I said, the Bible is supposed to be read in community. What do other people do? How can you learn and grow and support one another in digging deep into what God has said about himself and what he says about us and what he's got for us? The Bible is an inexhaustible well that as you read the word of God, it will transform you and it will transform things around you.